So welcome for today's session. This is John Mark here again. Eh? So today I want us to cover a topic. This is one of the widest topic. Uh, that's financing decision. And this topic is classified into two. We have the cost of capital, and then we have the special topics in financing decision. So I want us to start with the cost of capital. And what do we mean by the cost of capital? And then kindly listen to this topic because these are topics that never misses in each and every exam. Eh? So in this case, uh, you are staring at between 20, 10 to 20 marks. Now, what do we mean by the cost of capital? Now, when you talk about the cost of capital, for example, you have been, uh, you know what is NPV. And when you talk about the NPV, it's the inflow minus the outflow, but you have to take into consideration the time value for money. Now, how do you determine the cost of capital? Now, for example, you are told that the cost of capital is 10%. So how do they determine that cost of capital? Now, the cost of capital, this is the required rate of return by the investors who have provided fund in the company. So it's the required rate of return by the investors who have provided their capital in the company. And they are classified into three. We have the cost of equity. Now, for the equity in this case, eh, these are the ordinary shareholders. The ordinary shareholders, all the results belong to them, including the retained earnings, ordinary share capital. Also, we have the cost of preference shares. And then number three, we have the cost of debt or the cost of debentures. So I want us now we evaluate each and every component of the cost of capital, starting with the cost of equity. Now, we are saying that the cost of equity, this is the required rate of return by the ordinary shareholders. Those are the real owners of the company. And for the cost of capital, they are classified into two. Number A, we have the cost of retained earnings, and the cost of retained earnings denoted by KR. Then number B, we have cost of ordinary shares. This one is denoted by KE. So how do you determine the cost of retained earnings? To get the cost of retained earnings, KR, you take DO, 1 plus G, PO plus G, that's the growth rate. And how do we get the cost of ordinary share? KE, you take DO, 1 plus G, PO minus F. F represents the flotation cost plus the growth rate. Where? Where? What's DO? Also, what's DO 1 plus G? It's also the same as what we call D1. Eh? What's G? Uh, what's PO? And what's F? DO, this is the most recent dividend most recent dividend per share, most recent dividend per share. Now, DO1 plus G, if you take DO1 plus G, now in this case, you are determining how much is expected or the proposed dividends. Eh? So it's the same as D1. Eh? So D1, this is the expected dividend per share. So therefore, in this case, instead of having DO1 plus G, you can also work with D1 PO plus G because D1 is what we expect to pay. DO, this is what we had paid previously, and then you expect it to grow so that you can get the expected dividend. Then G is the growth rate. Yeah, the growth rate of that dividend. PO, this is the market price per share. F is the flotation, flotation cost. Now, flotation cost is the same as what we call the issuing cost, the cost in cut when you are raising those funds. So this one is the same as issuing cost. Now what you can note, the cost of retained earning and the cost of ordinary share, they are the same, the formula is the same. The only difference is only in this F. F is the flotation cost. For retained earnings, there is no flotation cost. Why? Now retained earnings, this is the money that the company already has. So they, incur, they will incur no cost to raise new funds. But for us to issue new shares, for us to issue new shares, Number one, you have to advertise, you have to print the prospectus. So there is no sum cost that you have to incur. Now that's what we call the flotation cost. Retained earnings, there is no flotation cost because you are dealing with the cash that you already have. Eh? But for you to issue new shares, you have to incur this flotation cost. Good. So that's the cost of equity. Now the second element we have uh, is the Okay, first of all, let me explain the growth rate. Now, the growth rate, sometimes you are not given the growth rate. How do you determine the growth rate? How do you determine the growth rate? For growth rate, we also covered it uh, in another topic. And growth rate, you can use two methods. One, we have what we call the compounding method. 
and a compounding method, this is how you get the growth rate. To get the growth rate, you take dn over do nth root minus 1. Then number B, we have what we call retention ratio method. Retention ratio method. At the retention ratio method, how do we get the growth rate? Now, to get the growth rate, you take RBE, where what's R? R is the retention ratio, and then BE is the return on equity. Return on equity. Now, for example, the first one. What's DN, what's DO? DN, DO. Now, DN, in this case, we represent the most leased dividend per share. DO is the first dividend. So don't confuse this. Eh? DO, in this case, is the first dividend. DN is the most recent. When you are determining the cost, DO now becomes the most recent. Eh? So now, this DN here, now, for example, let's assume you want to determine the growth rate. Eh? For year one, year two, year three, this is year four. Then you are given the dividends per share. In the first year, we had paid four, a dividend of 4.2, 4.6. This is 4. Point, uh, maybe 8. Eh? Now these are the D D uh, DPS. So now we want to determine the growth rate using the first method. Growth rate, we are saying it's dn over do nth root minus 1. Now, this I will determine. The first year, that's your DO, D1, D2, D3. So, your DN with the most recent dividend, which is 4.8. You divide by DO, the first dividend to be paid, which was 4, and the root. N represents the period. Now, here we have four years, but in this case, we are looking at N. N will be 3, D3. Why? Because from year one to year two, that's the first growth, second growth, third growth. So in this case, our n will be three, and then u minus one. That's how you determine the growth rate. Now, assuming now you get, we are assuming that the growth rate is five percent. Now we want to determine this. Kr. You take do one plus g. Now in this case, our do, <laughs> we're saying do is the most recent. In this case, you will not pick four. No. You see the most recent dividend was 4.8. Now this 4.8 is what you expected to grow by 5%. So in this case, don't confuse. DO when computing the growth rate is the first dividend. But when computing the cost of capital, this DO you take the last one, this DN. In this case, you could have taken 4.8 and then one plus you expected to grow by 5%, but not this one. So I've explained that. So that's uh, the retained earnings. So, growth rate, that's why we'll cover it in another topic. Eh? So, let me first of all eliminate that. So, you're still looking at the cost of capital. So, now you have looked at the cost of equity. They'll say that the cost of equity is made up of two elements. Cost of retained earnings, cost of ordinary share. Number B, or number two, is the cost of preference share. Cost of preference share, denoted by KP. Now, the cost of preference share, this is a required date of return by the preference shareholders. And how do you get the cost of preference share? To get the cost of preference share, you take the interest or the dividends. You divide by the value of the preference share. Then you deduct flotation cost in case there is any flotation cost times 100 percent, where VP this is the current value of preference share. That's the market value. Preference share. You have seen that F is the flotation cost. Then number three, we have the cost of the debt or the cost of debentures. And now this is the required rate of return by the debt holders, which is denoted by KD. Now KD, the cost of the debt, they are classified into two. Number one, we have in case of irredeemable, irredeemable debt or redeemable debenture or bond. And then number two, we have in case of redeemable, redeemable debenture. Now, what's the difference between redeemable and redeemable? Now, a redeemable debenture, this is a debenture of the bond with no specific maturity period. That means it's a debenture that cannot be bought back by the company, so it will exist to infinity. 
Redeemable debenture. Now, for example, if you invest in government bond, so maybe you invest for 10 years. You see it will mature after 10 years. Now that's what we call redeemable debenture. That means it's a debenture of the debt with a specific maturity period. Now how do we get the cost of irredeemable debenture? So to get KD, you take the interest, you divide by the value of the debt. Then one minus T. Why do we factor in one minus T? Now note that interest is allowable for tax purposes. So therefore, if the interest is allowable for tax purposes, when computing the cost of the debt, we have to factor in what we call the interest tax shield benefits. So that's why you take the interest over the value of the debt, that's the market value of the debt, then one minus T should always be net of tax because the interest is allowable for tax purposes. Now, in case of redeemable debenture, it's also known as yield to maturity. Yield to maturity. Now, how do we get yield to maturity? So, to get the cost of the debt or yield to maturity, you'll be taking the interest <coughs> plus maturity value minus value of the debt, then 1 over n. Then you take 1, uh, sorry, maturity value plus the value of the debt, then you get the average 1 minus t, where what is mv? What is VD? MV is the maturity value. And note that for the debt, the maturity value will always be the same as the par value. And par value is the same as face value or nominal value. Let me repeat again. We are saying that if you invest in government bond, worth, if you buy a government bond worth, worth 1 million, and the interest rate is maybe 10% per annum, maybe for five years. So that means at the end of the financial year, you'll be receiving an interest of 10% of this, which is 100,000. For the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and the fifth year. Then once at the end of the fifth year, your money will mature, then you'll get back what you had invested, one million. That's why I'm saying that the maturity value will be the same as the par value or the principal. How much had you invested? Good. Then VD, this is the current value of the debt. Current value of the debt, or just the market value of the debt. Then N is the maturity period. N is the maturity period. Then the debt you have to factor in one minus T. Then NB, interest is computed based on par value. That's constant. The interest will be computed based on the par value. And we say that the maturity value is the same as par value. If the par value was 100 shillings and the debt is 10%, then we have the current value. The current value, I assume, is 200 shillings. When you want to determine this interest, you'll take 10%, not of the market value, but of the par value of 100, which is 10. So note that the interest is always based on the par value. Then number two, Number two, in case of loan, you see in this case we're looking at the cost of the debt. Eh? Sometimes the company may not issue a debenture or a bond, may just decide to borrow from the bank. In case of the loan, how do you get the cost of the debt? To get the cost of the debt, you'll take the interest rate, interest rate, <coughs> one minus t. This is what I mean. If the company has 10% loan, that's from the bank. So you'll take 10%, now that's the interest rate, then remember, you're saying that the interest is allowable for tax purposes. One minus the tax rate, which is 30%. So therefore, the cost of the debt will be 7%. That's in case of a loan. Yeah, in case there is, no, there is no debenture, there is no bond, but you're given the loan, so that's how you get the cost of the debt. Good. So now, those are the three elements of the cost of capital. Cost of equity, cost of preference, and then we have the cost of the debt. But what we need now... Here we have just compute, uh, I showed you how to, uh, to compute the uh, specific component of each cost of capital. Now, how do we get the average? Now, to get the average, we have what we call weighted average cost of capital, WACC. When you're told that the cost of capital is 10%, how do they determine that 10%? Now, to get that 10%, they usually do get the aggregate average of all those three elements. You take the cost of equity, cost of preference share, and the cost of the debt. So you're saying that 
this is the average cost of existing funds. And how do we get WACC? To get the WACC, you take weight of equity, cost of equity, weight of preference, cost of preference, weight of the debt, cost of the debt, one minus two, as simple as that. Weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of preference, cost of preference. Weight of the debt, cost of the debt. Remember for the debt is always arable for tax purposes. Then, we also have what we call the weighted marginal cost of capital. Now this is WMCC. How do we get WMCC? To get WMCC, the formula is the same as WACC. Weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of preference, cost of preference. Weight of the debt, cost of the debt, one minus T. What's the difference? The difference is that for WACC, weighted average, you're saying that is the average cost of the existing funds. What about WMCC? Now, WMCC is the average cost of new funds to be issued or new funds to be raised. So that's the difference between the two. WACC, average cost of the existing fund. WMCC, average cost of the new fund. Therefore, that gives rise to uh, the difference between the two. So therefore, uh, in your notes, I have indicated the difference between the two. In WACC, we are saying that is the average cost of the existing fund. WMCC is the average cost of the new funds. Now that brings another difference. Since WACC is the cost of existing fund, we don't cons uh, consider the flotation cost because we say that the flotation cost is the cost to raise new funds. But this one we are talking about the cost of existing fund. But flotation cost we have to factor in WMCC. That's the second difference. Another difference is that for WACC, we don't consider the cost of retained earnings. But for WMCC, we consider the cost of retained earnings. Another difference is that WACC is used as a discounting factor when evaluating existing project. For WMCC, is used as a discounting factor when evaluating new projects. Another difference, for WACC, and this one is very important, eh? WACC, how do we get the weight? To get the weight, use the market value. Uh -huh. To determine weights, use market value. That means WACC for the weight keeps on changing. What about in WMCC? For WMCC, we use optimal capital structure. Capital structure, that means if the debt is 40%, preference 10%, and then equity 50%. That means the weight of the debt will always be 40, preference 10, equity 50. That is what we call the optimal capital structure. The optimal capital structure does not change. But for WACC, you'll be using at the market value. If the value of the market price per share increases, so that means the weight of the equity increases, and vice versa. So WACC, to determine the weight, use the market average, but for WMCC, use the weight, uh, the, we use the optimal capital structure. That means it does not change. Good. So this one is well explained in your notes. We have the differences between WACC and WMCC. Then, still under that, we have what we call now the breakpoint. Breakpoint. Now, what do we mean by breakpoint? Now, breakpoint, this is a point whereby a given source of capital is exhausted and an investor opts to go for the next expensive source of capital. Now, let me repeat again. We are saying that the breakpoint, this is a point where it's also known as the critical point. This is a point whereby a given source of capital is finished and the investor opts to go for the next expensive source of capital. Now, for example, in a company, the cheapest source of capital is the retained earnings. Now, once the retained earnings are exhausted, now the company, they will consider to issue new shares or to issue more shares. Once the shares have exhausted, they can decide to issue preference share. 
from the preference here, now they can issue the debenture. At what point do they determine that? Now, the retained earnings are exhausted. Now we need to go to the next expensive, which is the retained earnings. So now that, that's what you call the breakpoint. And this is how we determine the breakpoint. Breakpoint, you'll take the amount to raise from a given source, be it the equity, be it the debt, be it the preference share. Then you divide by the proportion. Proportion or the weights. That's how you get the breakpoint. And these are the decision criteria. Number one, if internal rate of return, that's IRR, is greater than WACC or WMCC, you can accept that project. Yeah, if the internal rate of return is greater than the average cost, you accept the project. Number two, if the internal rate of return is less than the cost, WACC or the WMCC, you need to reject the project. Number three, if IRR is equal to WACC or WMCC, that's what you call the point of indifference. Point of indifference. Depending on the risk appetite of the company, you can either take, uh, accept or reject the project. So you can look at that for one minute as we do an illustration. Just look at that. So we can do an illustration. So open with me, May 2017, question 4B. May 2017, question 4B. May Question 4B, I told that. <coughs> Rule Limited has a bond that has three years to maturity. Now, that's what we call a redeemable debt. Has three years to maturity. The bond per value is 1,000 shillings. Coupon payment for the bond is made annually. The current market value of the bond is 120% of the per value and the coupon uh, with a coupon of 12%. <coughs> Required yield to maturity. So how do we get the yield to maturity? Let's say that. Yield to maturity, that's what you call the cost of redeemable debenture. You take the interest plus maturity value minus the value of the debt, 1 over N. You divide by maturity value. You add the value of the debt. Then you get the average. You divide by 1 over 2. 1 minus T. In this question, you are not given the tax rate. If you are not given the tax rate, you ignore 1 minus T. So if there is no tax rate, that means there is no interest tax shield benefit. So ignore that. If you are given the tax rate, you factor 1 minus T. So how much is our interest? I also say that interest is based on the par value. <coughs> interest is based on the par value. The bond has a par value of 1,000. And how much is the interest rate? You are given the coupon rate is 12%. So that means you take 12% of 1,000, which is 120. So therefore, yield to maturity will be, you take the interest, which is 120, <coughs> plus maturity value. We see that maturity value is always the par value. And the par value, it's 1,000, minus 
the value of the debt. The current market value of the debt, we are told that. The current market value of the bond is 120% of the par value. It's 120% of the par value, which is 1,000. So you'll get 1,200. 1 over n. Our n, the bond is for 3 years, so it will be 1 over 3. Then you divide by maturity value, it's 1,000. Uh, the value of the debt, the current market value is 1,200. You add, then you get the average. Then you multiply, what you get, you multiply by 100%. The cost should always be in percentage. So in this case, we say that there is no 1 minus t, since there is no, we are not given the tax rate. Eh? And in this case, you will get 4.8%. 4.8%. Good. So I want us now we do a comprehensive question. I want us to do a comprehensive question. So open with me September 2021. <clears throat> September 2021, question 5B. September 2021, question 5B. September 2021, question 5B. So, and you are told that the management of Biashara Limited are in the process of determining the optimal capital budget for the company for the year ending that first December 2021. Now, let me give you a hint. Automatically, this question required WMCC. If you say, say that, WMCC is the average cost of the existing fund. WMCC, average cost of the new funds. So, in this case, they are planning on the budget for the coming year. So in short, they want to determine how much amount should they raise. So therefore, that makes it to be WMCC. The management of Biashara Limited are in the process of determining the optimal capital budget for the company for the year ending that 1st of December 2021. The following information is available. The profit after tax for the year ending that 1st December 2021 is estimated to be 22.5. That is expected profit after tax. The retention ratio is 60. Mm -hmm. How much is the retained earnings? We expect profit after tax of 22.5 million. Then you are to that, the retention ratio is 60. So we retain 60% of this. So 60%, eh? that's what we're told retention. Eh? Yeah, the retention is 60%. So you take 22.5 times 0.6. That means the retained earnings will be 13.5. If the retention ratio is 60, that means the dividend payout ratio is 40. Number three, the ordinary share of the company are currently trading on the security exchange at 80. That's PO, the market price per share. You can write that in your question paper. Number four, ordinary shareholders expect a dividend of six per share for the year ending that first December 2021. They expect a dividend. Now that's what you call D1 the expected dividend. We see that DO is the most recent dividend. Now this one is what they expect, so you already given D1 in this case. Number five, the annual growth rate in dividend is 6%, that's G. Flotation cost amount to eight per share issued, that's F. The company could issue unlimited number of 11% preference share at 96 per share. Now that 96 is the value of the preference. The par value is 100. Number eight, the company could obtain a bank loan of up to 24 million at a pre-tax interest rate of 10% per annum. Thereafter, an unlimited amount of bond could be issued under the following terms. One, coupon interest rate 12% per annum, par value 1,000 per bond, discount 30 shillings per bond, flotation cost 20 shillings per bond, maturity period 10 years. Now that's what we call a redeemable bond. The optimal capital structure of the company comprises, yeah, when you talk about the optimal capital structure, that's WMCC. 
you see that for WACC, it uses the market weight. For WMC cent debt, 40% preference shares, capital, and 45% equity. Corporate tax rate is 30%. Required, <clears throat> the cost of capital for each source of finance available to be a share, the cost of capital of each source. So we need to get the cost of retained earnings, cost of ordinary share, cost of preference share, and the cost of the debt. How do we get the cost of retained earnings? This is DO1 plus G, PO plus G. Then we see that DO1 plus G is the same as D1. D1, PO plus G. DO is the most recent dividend, but in this case, we see that D1 is what we expect, and that's what we are given. Can you go to note number four? Ordinary shareholders, Expect a dividend of six. So you're given what they expect. So it's six. So all this is six. PO, the market price per share, note number three. Ordinary share of the company are currently trading and security exchange at 80. Then you add the growth rate. Note number five. The annual growth rate in dividend is 6%. So it's 0 0.06. We get the cost of ordinary share is the same. DO, one plus G. PO, but for ordinary share, you have to deduct the flotation cost. Then you add the growth rate. And you see that DO1 plus D is the same as D1, of which you are given is 6. Market price per share is 80. But for us to issue new shares, we have to incur flotation cost. Note number 6. Flotation cost amounts to 8 per share issued. So you have a flotation cost of 8 shillings. And then you add the growth rate, 0 0.06. Then you see that for the cost, always make sure they're in percentage. So 6 you divide by 8, then you add 0 0.06. So this one you'll get is 13.5%. And so this one is 6 you divide by 72. You add 0 0.06. And here you'll get 14.33%. Uh -huh. The other one is cost of preference. You see that cost of preference, you take the interest over the value of the preference. You raise flotation in case there is any flotation, you multiply by 100. Let's get the interest. Then you have said that interest will be based always on par value. Let's go to note number seven. The company could issue unlimited number of 11%. So that means the interest of the dividend rate is 11%. Uh -huh. 11% preference share at 96 per share, the power value is 100. So the interest we are saying that it's 11% of the power value of which is 100. You divide by the value of the preference. We'll issue this preference at 96. Then you multiply by 100. So 11 over 96, that's 11.46%. That's the cost of preference share. Then lastly, we have the cost of the debt. Now, for the cost of the debt, <coughs> there are two. For the cost of the debt, there are two. Hmm. Number one, we have for the loan, and then we have for the bond. Let's go to note number eight. The company could obtain a bank loan of up to 24 million at a pre-tax rate of 10%. So we see that in case of a loan, the interest rate becomes the cost of capital. So we see that you will take the interest rate 1 minus t, of which you are given that interest rate is 10%, 1 minus t, the tax rate is 30%, 0 0.3, and you will get 7%. Then we have a bond, or yield to maturity, yield to maturity. How do we get yield to maturity? Interest, maturity value, value of the debt, 1 over n, maturity value plus the value of the debt, a half, 1 minus t. We get the interest. So now let's read that. See that number eight. The company could obtain a bank loan of up to 24 million at a pre tax interest rate of 10% per annum. Thereafter, an unlimited amount of bond could be issued at the following terms coupon interest rate, 12%. Par value, 1,000. Discount, 30. Flotation, 20. Maturity period, 10 years. So if you're given the maturity period, that's yield to maturity. So now let's determine the element of interest. The coupon rate is 12% and the interest will always be based on the par value. 
How much is the power value? The second bullet, the power value is 1,000, and you get an amount of 120. Maturity value is always the power value, which is 1,000. Value of the debt. How do we get the value of the debt, the market value of the debt? You see the power value is 1,000, but you are told that there is a discount. You have to give out a discount of 30 shillings. You deduct the discount. Then you cut a flotation cost of 20. Therefore, how much will you fetch from the issue of that bond? So you'll fetch an amount of 850 from the market. So that's how you get the value of the debt. So therefore, yield to maturity, you'll take the interest which is plus maturity value is always the power value 1,000 minus the value of the debt. The value of the debt is 950. 1 over n. Maturity period is 10 years. Then you divide by 1,000, then you add 950, then you get the average. 1 over 2 times 1 minus t. The tax rate is 30%, so 1 minus 0 0.3, you get 0 0.7. So how much do you get? So that's 50, that's 5, so that's 1050. I mean 1950 divided by 2. Then you take 125 divided by the answer, you multiply by 0.7. Uh -huh. So, and this one you get 8.9 times 100. 8.97%. So, let me repeat it again. So, that's 50. 50 divided by 10 is 5. Eh? So, 1950 divided by 2. 125 divided by answer times 0.7, yeah, it's 8.97. Good, I see past that. So we have answered part A of the question. The component cost of each source of capital. Number two, number two, the breakpoint in the marginal cost of, uh, marginal cost of capital schedule with respect to retained earning and debt. Number two is the breakpoint. We say that breakpoint, this is a point whereby a given source of capital is exhausted and the investor opts to go for the next expensive source of capital. And we say that to get the breakpoint, you take amount to raise from a given source, then you divide by the weight of proportion. And when determining the breakpoint, you only compute for what you have the specific amount. For example, in this case, they say that the breakpoint, the marginal cost of capital, schedule with respect to retained earnings and debt. Retained earnings and debt. Even if you are not told about retained earnings and debt, just look what we have the specific amount. For example, in this case, we have retained earnings, which is 13.5. That's what we call the amount raise, 13.5. Debt, for the debt, we have our own. Our own, we are given the specific amount. Let's go to note number eight. The company could obtain a bank loan of up to 24 million. So from roll is 24. Now that's the amount raised. You divide by the weight or the proportion. Now let's go to note number nine. The optimal capital structure comprises of 15% debt. Debt represents 15%. Roll is part of the debt, so 15% is 0 0.15. Retained earning is part of equity. So how much is the equity? Uh -huh. Preference share 40% and 45% equity. So equity is 45, 0.45. So how much is the breakpoint? So 13.5, you divide by 0.45. I'll get 30 million. Here we have 24 divided by 0.15. That's 160 million. So those are the breakpoints. Now I want you to pay attention here. Just reason here. We say that retained earning, I mean equity, they are classified into two. There is cost of retained earnings, and the cost of retained earnings here we have is 13.5. Then we have the cost of ordinary share. The cost of ordinary share we have is 14.33%. Also the debt we have to. For the debt, we have the one for own, and the cost of the debt of the own we have is 7%. For the yield to maturity, that's for the bond, we have it's 8.97. Let's just work with 9%. Yeah, 
Yeah, 9%. Now, what, how does, what do we mean by that? Now, listen here. Retained earning is part of the equity. And you're saying that the breakpoint is a point where a given source of capital is exhausted and the investor opts to go for the next expensive source of capital. Retained earning is that. So that means under the equity, under the equity, anything between zero to 30, we can afford through the issue of, uh, through the use of retained earning. Which is cheaper at 13.5. Let me repeat again. The retained earnings breakpoint is 30. Retained earning is part of the equity. So that means anything under equity below 30 or between, between 0 to 30, we can afford through the issue of ret uh, through the retained earnings, of which the cost of retained earnings is cheaper at 13.5. Now, for we to raise an additional equity capital, anything above 30, now that's when you go to the next expensive source, which is now we issue new shares, which is expensive at 14.33. I repeat again, under the equity between 0 to 30, we use the cost of retained earnings, which is 13.5, which is cheaper. But once it exceeds 30, we go to the next expensive equity element, which is ordinary share, which is expensive at 14.33%. If you didn't understand that, understand for the debt then. For the debt, we have a own, and the breakpoint for own is 160. So that means under the debt, between 0 to 160, that's for the debt. You see, this one is for the loan. We can be able to afford through the cost of the debt or the cost of the loan, which is cheaper at 7%. If the debt now exceeds 160, we go to the next expensive, which is the redeemable bond, which is expensive at 9%. That's the evaluation on how you interpret that. Eh? Good. So if you have understood that, now we can be able to do the other part. Now, the other part is what now requires the knowledge of what we have, have, have been explaining here. Number three. Number three, we are told that the marginal cost at the WMCC at each breakpoint identified B above. So you want WMCC. How do we get WMCC? Weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of preference, cost of preference. Weight of the debt, cost of the debt, one minus D. How many WMCC do we compute? Now, for WMCC to compute, it will be based on the breakpoint. We have two breakpoints, 30, 160. So we'll say that between zero, the minimum between 30 and 160 is 30 to 30. Above that million to the next, which is 160, and then above 160. So that means we'll compute three breakpoints. I mean three WMCC. You look at the breakpoint. You take the minimum. So between zero to the minimum, above that to the next breakpoint, and then above the maximum breakpoint. So therefore, you take the weight of equity. So how much the weight of equity? Let's start with the weight of equity. Let's go to note number nine. In note number nine, the optimal capital structure of the company comprised 15% debt, 40% preference share capital, and 45 equity. So equity is 45. So the weight of equity is 0 0.45. It's weight of equity, cost of equity. Now let's work with the cost of equity. Now we say that the cost of equity, there are two. We have the cost of retained earnings, cost of ordinary share. Retained earnings is part of the equity. So anything between 0 to 30, we use the cost of retained earnings. Between 0 to 30, under the equity here, use the cost of retained earnings, which is 13.5. Once it exceeds 30, we go to the next expensive source, which is now we have to issue new shares, which is 14.33. So anything above that, so this one is above that, this one is above that. Now we use 14.33%, 14.33%. So that's weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of preference, so note number nine, preference share capital is 40%, so it's 0 0.4. Then you multiply by the cost of preference. Now the cost of preference was only one, so that one is just one. So cost of preference share is 11.46. So 11.46, 11.46, 11.46, plus weight of the debt, cost of the debt. Note number nine, the weight of the debt is 15%, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, 0 0.15, times the cost of the debt. For the debt, we have the breakpoint, which is 160. Now, this 160 was for the loan. So under the debt, 
Anything between 0 to 160, we can be able to afford through the issue of loan, of which the cost of the loan is cheaper at 7%. So between 0 to 160, we use the cost of the loan, which is 7%. Between 0 to 60, so that means for the two ranges, the cost will be 7. 7, 7. If it exists 160, you go to the next expensive, which is the bond, yield to maturity at 9%, of which above 160, for the debt, we use 9%. Then there is this element of 1 minus t. Don't factor in this because when you are computing the cost of the loan, we have already factored that the interest tax yield benefit, as well as for the yield to maturity, you have already factored 0 0.7. So in this case, you don't take into consideration that. So how much do we get there? So 13.5, then we have 0 0.4, 11, 0.46. 0.157. So this one we have it's 11.71 percent. 0.45 times 14.33. 0.4 uh, 11.46. 0.157. This one is 12.08 percent. 4.5 times 14.33. 4 times 11.46. 159. And this one is 12.38%. Good. So that's how you answer that question. So you can take just one minute. You can look at that before now we do another illustration. Just take one minute. So let's try another illustration. Another illustration. November 2019, question 1C. November 2019, question 1C. November. November 2019, question 1C. Now, once you are told that, the current capital structure of a hard limited is given as follows. So, we're given the ordinary share, 10 per cent debenture, preference share. So, we have the three component of equity. I mean three component of capital. The current market value of ordinary share and preference share is 50 and 30. Number two, the debenture are irredeemable. So this one is a case of irredeemable debenture. And have a market value of 120 per 100 nominal value. Now that 100 is the same as the per value. Number three, the most recent earnings per share of the company was six. The most recent. Now that's what you call EO or the most recent earnings per share. The company currently adopts 60% dividend payout ratio. So how much is the dividend per share? That's what you call DO. Let me explain something. Now let's go back to note number three. The most recent earnings per share of the company was six. That was earnings, not dividend. But in number four, you're told that. The company currently adopts 60% dividend payout ratio. So we pay 60% of this earning as dividend. So if the earnings was six per share, and you should adopt 60% payout ratio, how much was the dividend per share? It was 3.6. Now this one becomes DO, the most recent dividend per share. However, the firm future dividend are expected to grow at the rate of 7% each year for the foreseeable future. That's the growth rate. 
growth rate is 7%. Number five, corporate tax rate is 30%. So tax rate is 30%. Require the company WACC using the market value weights, WACC. How do we get WACC? Weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of preference, cost of preference. Weight of the debt, cost of the debt, one minus T. We see that for WMCC, we use the optimal capital structure. It does not change. But for WACC, for you to get the weight, use the market value. And how do we get the weights? Now, this is how we get the weights. For the weights, we have equity. Then we have preference shares. And then we have the debt. Now, let's go to the optimal capital structure. Ordinary share capital, it's that million. You divide by the par value. You see, it's ordinary share each at 10. You divide by 10 so that you can get the current number of shares. You just do like this. Eh? You take 30,000, you divide by 10, that's the par value, to get the, market, uh, to get the number of shares. Then you multiply by the current number of shares, uh, we multiply by the current market price per share. Note number one, the current market value of ordinary share and preference share is 50 and 30, so the market price per share is 50. We do the same for preference share. How much the preference share capital? It's 5 million, you divide by the par value, you are told that each is 20, you get the number of preference share. Then note number one, you multiply by the current market price per share per of preference, which is 30. Debt, how much is the debt capital? We have 10% debentures. 10% debenture will take 15 million. You divide by the par value. Let's go to note number two. Note number two. The debentures are irredeemable and have a market value of 120 per shillings 100 nominal value. Nominal value is the same as par value. The par value is 100. You get the number of debentures. Then you multiply by the current market price, which is currently selling at 120. So how much is that? So what do you get there? So here you have it's 150. 150 million. Here you have it's 7.5. And here you have it's 18. Then you add the total. So the total is 25,500. Then you convert them into probabilities. 150 over 175, to get that proportion, you'll get is 0 0.85. 7.5 you divide by 175.5, that one represents 0 0.04. And then 18 divided by 175, that one is 0 0.11. So now you already have the weights. Weight of equity, weight of preference, weight of the debt. Now we determine the cost. Do we have the cost of equity? There is something else I also said. One of the difference between WACC and WMCC. For WACC, we don't consider the cost of retained earnings. Just check that on your, on your differences, on your notes. Eh? That for WACC, we don't consider the cost of retained earnings. So we consider only the cost of ordinary share, which is DO, 1 plus J, PO minus rotation in case there is any, then you add the growth rate. How much is DO? Here is our DO. Our DO we had was 3.6. 1 plus the growth rate, here we have the growth rate, 7%, 0 0.07. PO, that's the current market price per share. Let's go to note number one. The market price per share, it's 50. Then you add the growth rate, 0 0.07. Then once you get the cost, you multiply by 100. We see that the cost should always be in percentage. So how much is the cost of ordinary share? So it will get an amount of 14.7. So now you already have the cost of equity. We get the cost of preference. So cost of preference, you take the interest over the value of the preference times 100%. So how much is the interest? Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the capital structure. And the capital structure, we have 12% preference here. Now if it's 12%, that means the interest is 12% of the par value. The power value is what we have in bracket, which is 20. Then you divide by the current value of the preference. So let's go to note number one. The current value of the preference share we have is 30 shillings. 
then you multiply by 100. And how much do you get? So the cost of preference you get is 8%. Lastly, uh, we have for the debt, cost of the debt. We see that for the debt we have redeemable and irredeemable. This one is irredeemable. You're not given the maturity period. Eh? Yeah, that one, let's go to note number four. The, uh -huh, number two, the debenture are irredeemable and have a market value of 120 per 100 nominal value. We see that in case of irredeemable debenture or debt, how do we get the cost of the debt? We see that it's interest over the value of the debt, one minus t. How do we get the interest? So the interest rate of the debt, the interest rate of the debt we have there, yeah, is 10% debenture. So you'll take 10% and you see that the interest is based on the par value. Note number two, we are given the par value there. The debenture are redeemable and have a market value of 120 per 100 nominal value. Nominal value is the same as par value. You divide by the value of the debt, which is the current is selling at 120. One minus T, you are given the tax rate. So one minus T is 0 0.7. So what do you get? So it will get an amount of 5.83%. So now with that, we can get WCC. We have all the ingredients for us to get WCC. Weight of equity, here you have the weight of the equity, 0 0.85. You multiply by cost of equity. And the cost of equity we have is 14.7% plus weight of preference. The preference, the weight is 0 0.04 times the cost of preference share. The cost of preference share we have is 8. Last three, weight of the debt, the debt, the weight is 0 0.11 times the cost of the debt. And the cost of the debt we have is 5.83%. Now we say that here we have one minus t. But since when you're computing the cost of the debt, you have already factored that, the interest tax will benefit. You don't write one minus t, so don't factor that. So how much will be the weighted average cost of capital? The weighted average cost of capital, in that case, we'll have it's an amount of 13.46%. 13.46%. Another illustration. May 2012. May 2012, question 2A. May 2012, question 2A. May 2012, question 2A. 2A, you are told that. Lock Limited is planning to issue a 10% million, shilling 0.25 shares, with a current market price of 1.55 CAM dividends. Now, when you talk about, we have what we call CAM and X. CAM means inclusive of dividend. If it's inclusive of dividend, you should always value the share based on X dividend. Eh? So the market value is 1.5 CAM dividend. So that means it's already inclusive of dividend. So you have to work with X dividend. An annual dividend of 0 0.09 has been proposed. So how much is PO? You see that PO is the same as market price per share. Now let's read that statement again. Lock Limited is planning to issue 10 million sharing 0 0.25 shares with a current market price of 1.55 CAM dividend. So it's 1.55 CAM 
come dividend. The dividend is already inclusive. So you have to deduct that dividend. Eh? An annual dividend of 0 0.09 has been proposed. So they had already proposed 0 0.09 so that you can get X dividends. And how much uh, will be that? So that one is 1.46. That one is 1.46. Uh -huh. Then I told that. The company earns an accounting rate of return on equity of 10% and dividend payout ratio is 40. Let's read that statement again. The company earns an accounting rate of return on equity of 10% and the dividend payout ratio is 40. So if you're given that information, that means you are not given the growth rate. And how do we get the growth rate? I gave you two formula on how to get the growth rate. We have the compounding method and retention ratio method. So the one for retention ratio method, we see that growth rate is RBE, where we see that R is the retention ratio, retention ratio, and BE is the return on equity. Let's get the growth rate. How much the retention ratio? I told that. The company has an accounting rate of return on equity of 10%, and dividend payout ratio is 40. If the dividend payout ratio is 40, how much do we retain? We retain 60%, good. Retention ratio will take 60% since we are, uh, we are paying 40%. Then you multiply by BE, which is the return on equity. The return on equity is 10%. 60% of 10, that is 6%, and that's how we get our growth rate. Mm -hmm. The company also has 13%, Shillings a handed redeemable debenture with a nominal value of 7 million trading at 105. So that's the debt. The debenture are due to be redeemed at par in five years' time. So it's a redeemable debenture. Assume a corporate tax rate of 30% required. WACC, 10 marks, WACC. So how do we get WACC? Weight of equity, cost of equity. So in this case, there is no preference here. You are not given any preference here. So you're only given the equity and the debt. Weight of equity, cost of equity. Weight of the debt, cost of the debt, one minus T. Then since we are computing WACC, how do we get the weights? To get the weights, for WACC, use the market weighted. So how do we get the weights? To get the weight number one, we get for the equity, we get for the debt. And how do we get for the equity? It's very simple. For the equity, how many shares do we have? Let's read the first paragraph. Rock Limited is planning to issue 10 million. Now, this, that's not the share capital. Those are the number of shares. We'll issue 10 million. How much is the power value? Shitting 0 0.25, that's the power value. So that means we have 10 million share. You multiply by the market price. Here is the PO. You see, it was 1.55 come interest come dividend. You eliminate the dividend, so that means the market price is 1.46. So that means it's 14.6. Let's go to the debt. For the debt, let's go to the last sentence. The second last sentence of the first paragraph. The company also has 13% shillings a handle redeemable debenture. That shillings a handle is what we call the par value, with a nominal value of shillings 7 million. That's now shillings. Eh? Shillings 7 million, you divide by the par value, which is 100, so that you can get the number of debentures. Then you multiply by the current market price, trading at 105. Each is trading at 105. You see, this 10, this was, was not in shillings, those were the number of shares. If you are given, you had, could have given shillings 10 million, that's what you could have taken. Shillings 10 million, you divide by the par value, which was 0 0.25, then you multiply by the x market price per share, which is 1.46. But in this case, we are given the number of share. Now, for the debt, this one you are given in shilling. Shilling 7 million, pound value is 100, you divide by 100 to get the number of debenture, then you multiply by the market price per share, which is 105. And with that, how much do you get? So this one you get is 7.35. Then you add the two. If you add the two, you'll get 21.95. Then you convert them into proportion. 14.6 divided by 21.5, you get 0 0.67. This one will be 0 0.33. That means the equity represents 67% of the total capital. Debt represents a third. So now we have the weights. What else do we need? We need the cost of equity. 
cost of equity d o 1 plus g p o plus g how much is d o now in this case we are not given d o we are given d 1 we say that d 1 is what we expect to pay now let's go to the second sentence of the first paragraph that an annual dividend of 0 0.09 has been proposed if we have proposed that's what we expect to pay d1 that's d01 plus d it's 0 0.09 po here we have the po po is 1.46 plus the growth rate we have already computed the growth rate which is 6 percent 0 0.06 then what you get you multiply by 100 percent so what do you get in that so one half is 12.16. So we have the cost of equity. So now we need the cost of the debt. How do we get the cost of the debt? Now this one is a redeemable. In case of redeemable debenture, that yield to maturity. Interest plus maturity value, value of the debt, one over N, maturity value, value of the debt, a half, one minus T. Let's get the interest. Now for the interest, we are told that the company also has 13% shillings a hundred redeemable debenture. So interest is 13% of the power value of which is 100, you get 13. Eh? So therefore this one, you'll have interest is 13, plus maturity value is always the power value, which is 100. Value of the debenture currently is trading at 105. One minus N, it will mature in the next five years. That one you're given in the last sentence. Eh? Then you divide by 100 plus 105, then you get the average, one over two times 1 minus t. The tax rate is 30, so therefore it will be 0 0.7. And what you get, you multiply by 100. And what do we get in that? So that one you get 8.2. So now let's get WACC. So WACC, you take weight of equity, and you already have the weights. Equity is 0 0.67. You multiply by the cost of equity, and the cost of equity we have is 12.16% plus weight of the debt. For the weight of the debt here we have is a third, 0.33. You multiply by the cost of the debt, and the cost of the debt here we have is 8.2. And with that you get 10.85%. It's as simple as that. So first of all, write the formula. Once you write the formula, now you are, and you are able to determine what are the ingredients. First of all, you need weight. You compute the weight. You need the cost of equity. Compute the cost of equity. You need the cost of the debt. Compute the cost of it. As simple as that. So let me give you some assignment here. At your own time, you can go and try... November 2017. Actually, this is a topic that never misses. Also, May 2017, question 1C. Also, May 2021. Actually, those uh, assignments, they're already in your notes. Eh? They're already in your notes. We shall do more questions during our Brock's revision. So, in your notes, kindly go through the disadvantages of WACC. And then we have the differences between WACC and WMCC. That's another highly examinable theory part. Eh? So in our next session, still under the same, same topic, we look at the capital structure theory of a company. So now that's in our next topic. So thank you for your time.